Good afternoon, everyone. It's a great pleasure to kick off this exciting series of talks in this colloquium series on AI research and optimization, or Cairo. There are a number of interesting things that will be discussed, including optimization methods and algorithms, high performance implementations of parallel and distributed learning frameworks, as well as uh, hardware architecture advances. This follows uh, activity in proposal submission in, to, uh, to a recent call. We have a number of folks at LSU who are part of this uh, project that is started and led by Hartmut Kaiser. PCT is happy to host, support, and do everything for this. LSU Office of Research is a co-sponsor for this series. Sam Bentley, Vice President for Research, will give uh, remarks at the next colloquium with two weeks from today at the same time, 1 p.m. I really would like to thank the local organizers for this. There's Patrick Deal, Katie Bailey, Hartmut Kaiser, Bita Hashem and Azad, and Mayang Tiagi. The, and um, they have done a lot of work to get this up and going. So without anything, without being between you and the colloquium, let me go ahead and send it back to Patrick, who will introduce the speaker. Thank you. Hey, thank you, Ram. So welcome to the first talk with the title Inexact Proximal Stochastic Gradient Method for Empirical Risk Minimization. And the speaker today is Hang Cha Tsang from LSU, and he received his PhD in Applied Mathematics from University of Florida in 2006. He then had a postdoc position at the Institute for Mathematics and its Application and IBM TEG Watch and Research Center. He joined LSU as an assistant professor in 2008 and is now a professor in the Department of Mathematics and at the Center for Computation and Technology at LSU. And his research interests are nonlinear optimization theory, algorithms, and applications. And Charles, the stage is yours. Oh, okay. Thank you. Okay, first, uh, before uh, I give this talk, so uh, we, we want to first thank uh, our director, Ram, CCT director, Ram, for uh, giving the, uh, the nice uh, opening remarks. And uh, we, I also want to thank the Patrick and uh, the Stellar group uh, for inviting me to give the talk. Uh, I have to say, it, it's really my pleasure to give this talk, okay? So, um, and in this talk, I want to uh, talk about some of our work. Sorry. Okay. Some of our work on the uh, inexact uh, proximal. Okay. Uh, on the inexact proximal stochastic gradient methods for empirical risk minimization. Uh, uh, this is a talk with is a joint. This talk is a joint work with uh, one of my. Uh, visitors, uh, Xiao Wang, uh, who is now a uh, faculty at the University of Chinese Academy of Science. Okay. Uh, now, first, uh, uh, let's uh, let's look at uh, the model problem we are trying to solve. Okay, we are trying to minimize uh, this function p of w, uh, which is the addition of these two functions. Here, f. Uh, is the average of many smooth but possibly non-convex component functions. So this f of w is often written as this form, and uh, h is a regular regularization function. Okay, but we assume h is convex but possibly non-smooth. Okay, and uh, this problem in the literature uh, was also known as the so-called regularized uh, empirical risk minimization. And it often arises in many applications, uh, in the data applications, uh, such as the classification, the regression, regression models in machine learning or deep learning. Okay, for example, in deep learning, uh, this f, uh, 
uh, can be uh, often uh, written as a summation of some loss functions. Like uh, here, I, I just use a uh, uh, two norm loss functions. And uh, here, uh, the H is the activation function. Really, here, W, you can consider W is the uh, parameter of this uh, uh, activation function H. Uh, you want to find a W such that you can predict the, the given data Xi to the uh, target data uh, Yi. Okay? So you solve this minimization function to find this uh, uh, optimal parameters W. But from optimization point of view, one key uh, feature is, is that the number of component functions here, this N, is very large. Okay, Sometimes it's huge. So, uh, so it is sometimes it's uh, uh, too expensive or, or usually uh, prohibitive to evaluate the full gradient at each iteration. Okay, so it's too expensive to calculate the full gradient since it involves calculating the uh, gradient of each component functions. Okay, and the sense if you look at this function, it, the, the optimization problem it, it itself is a deterministic problem. Okay. Uh, so in principle, this problem can be solved by standard proximal gradient methods. So for standard, grid, uh, standard proximal gradient method, it does the following iterations. Uh, at iteration k, uh, you solve this uh, subproblem. It's called a proximal mapping subproblem to find the new iteration point, uh, wk plus 1. And here, eta k is a proximal parameter. Uh, you can view this eta k as uh, some type of step size. Okay. <clears throat> then uh, when it has the following convergence uh, uh, kind of convergence results, uh, when f is convex, if you want to have uh, uh, achieve an epsilon solution, that means if you want to find a wk such that the function value gap is less than epsilon, the number of the number of uh, <clears throat> uh, iterations can be bounded by one over epsilon. And uh, by combining with Nesterov's acceleration technique, okay, this iteration bound uh, can be improved to one over square root of epsilon. <clears throat> and when this f is non-convex, um, in this case, we, in this case, <clears throat> since the function is non-convex, we cannot really bound the function value gap then we can bound the proximal gradient of this objective function. If the proximal gradient is zero, we know then we got a stationary point, or you may say the first order optimality point of the objective function. And then you can get <clears throat> you can show the rate is kind of one over epsilon square. Okay. So these are the standard results in the literature for deterministic uh, proximal gradient method. But here <clears throat> Our problem, as I said, is that uh, the number of component gradient is so large. Okay, so then we people want to use the stochastic gradient method uh, to solve the problem. Then the stochastic gradient method actually explores the, the special structure of f. This f is being sum of uh, a large number of deterministic functions. Uh, then. <clears throat> So this, this is the classic proximal gradient method also solves a proximal mapping sum problem like this. Here, the difference is that instead of using this full gradient at SK, uh, it uses the stochastic gradient, GK. Here, this GK is a stochastic approximation of the true gradient. And with a property that, such that uh, uh, this GK is the unbiased uh, uh, estimation of the true gradient. Okay. And uh, depending, and there are many uh, stochastic gradient methods in the literature uh, to solve these problems. I think uh, uh, here I just list uh, uh, some of the well known uh, frameworks of the stochastic gradient methods. I think these methods are differed from uh, how to choose this. Uh, uh, <clears throat> they are different from how to choose this stochastic gradient and uh, how to combine the so-called the variance reduction techniques in the algorithms, then people have developed many well-known methods, okay, uh, like this. 
<clears throat> here, uh, I just want to give a, a, a motivation, uh, our motivation of uh, why do we consider exact uh, proximal gradient method? So our our uh, approximate our motivation is the following. Okay, basically we have two major points. The first point is that uh, this regularization function h here is uh, this h often does not have is sometimes it is complicated. It does not have some special structure, and uh, and uh, sometimes we also use. Uh, uh, we also want to incorporate uh, some second order information in this sub problem by here. If you look at second order method, people use the B, uh, some matrix norm here instead of two norm. So then the sub problem becomes more complicated. So when H does not have special structure, all this B has, uh, uh, has the, the, this matrix using the matrix norm, then uh, this sub problem will not, does not have a closed form solution. In this case, uh, it is very expensive. And in theory, in theory, actually, it is impossible to solve this sub problem exactly. And that is one point. The other point is, uh, uh, anyway, is the following. Uh, anyway, this stochastic uh, sub problem is built on the stochastic gradient. Okay, this is a very rough approximation of the true the cost of the true gradient mapping. So, so it's really unnecessary to spend great efforts for solving this sub problems exactly, especially in the early iteration of the algorithm. Uh, <clears throat> so our goal here, we want our goal here is we want to solve the stochastic sub problem exactly while still keeping the same desired. Uh, algorithm complexity bound as that of the solving the sub problem exactly. So yeah, in the other words, we want to solve the the the, the sub problem exactly without losing anything from the complexity bound complexity point of view. That means you you solve it exactly, you still get the same complexity bound. Okay. We think this is uh, this is not only theoretically important because theoretically it is impossible to solve the sub problem exactly, but it also has a great uh, practical importance. B because if you solve the sub problem exactly, from uh, you save the computational cost. Okay, uh, that is two major uh, <clears throat> two major uh, uh, the two major motivations. Then uh, before we talk about the algorithm. So let's first uh, briefly talk about the deterministic inexact method. The deterministic inexact method, uh, uh, actually it does the, uh, the following iterations. At each iteration, it, do, it also does not use the, the full gradient. It use the perturbation of the full gradient with the error EK, okay, with the error. And then it also solves the sub problem inexactly to accuracy eta K. Okay? And uh, it shows if the <clears throat> these errors decreases at this rate, uh, you can still have a convergence with rate one over k. If the errors decrease at uh, this rate, the convergence rate uh, is uh, the following. Okay. Um. So so these are the results for deterministic uh, inexact method. But uh, one one k. Uh, one main challenge for the uh, stochastic gradient method is the following: because for stochastic gradient methods, uh, you at most uh, you can only assume the variance of the stochastic gradient is is bounded. It may not even reduce. Not to mention it reduces the error reduced to zero. So so the the, the stochastic gradient the, the the total variations may not even uh, reduce. That is one one difficulty. So because of this, people uh, <clears throat> incorporate various reduction techniques to reduce the stochastic variance. Okay, and in our framework of exact proximal stochastic gradient method, we also combine with uh, variance reduction techniques. Um, here, let me see. Uh, here, before we talk about the algorithm, first we want to uh, give a formal definition. Uh, what do we mean by 
we want to give a formal definition. What do we mean by g exact solution of the solved problem? Okay. So uh, here, if you look at uh, all the sub problems in the proximal gradient method, they all have by completing the squares. Okay, you translate, uh, you trust, you change uh, uh, a little bit of the sub problem. Uh, then they all have this kind of this uh, form. The sub problem all have this form. Here we want to make it to be more general to use the uh, matrix B K. We use the B B B norm here. Uh, so this B this matrix can be chosen to capture some uh, second order curvature information of F, if you, if you can choose the proper B. And if this B is just uh, a scalar, say one over epsilon times the identity matrix, then this is corresponding to the first order method. Okay. Here is our definition of the inexact solution of the process of mapping some problem. But before we, 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 we talk about this, so let's uh, uh, here, uh, let's recall the epsilon sub differential of a convex function, okay? So given a convex function, um, um, normally it's a proper lower semi-continuous convex function. So it's a epsilon sub differential at Z is defined to be this set, okay? Uh, so that is for all Y, uh, that is uh, for all y, which uh, for for all w, which is satisfied this e equality, uh, is called uh, uh, epsilon sub sub derivative of z, okay, at at z of, uh, of this function fair. You can see if epsilon is zero, this this y is really the standard uh, sub derivative of a convex function. Okay, this is just uh, a a, gen uh, a generalization of sub derivative, and uh, with this definition. Uh, we give our new definition uh, of uh, uh, the exact solution of this sub problem. So the, the definition is the following. So given here, we use the epsilon bar and the epsilon hat uh, uh, as two tolerances. Given these tolerances, we call Z to be an epsilon bar and epsilon hat solution of the proximal mapping sub problem. If there exists, there exists a U which satisfy that satisfy these two uh, conditions. Uh, actually, if you take uh, the tolerance to be zero, epsilon bar is zero, epsilon hat is zero, then this Z will be the, the exact solution of this uh, uh, problem, okay? But uh, we, <clears throat> we want to have this tolerance U, we want to the, the have this tolerance U because this U can include the error on the evaluation of the stochastic, stochastic gradient. When you evaluate the stochastic gradient, it may introduce some no matter numerical error or some noise, okay? This U can include those error. And this uh, uh, <clears throat> epsilon sub differential of H, uh, this represents error uh, allowed in the sub differential of H. You do not use exact sub differential, you use epsilon sub differential, okay? <clears throat> uh, in fact, uh, this uh, uh, this definition had a very uh, had a had a very nice geometric uh, interpretation. Okay, uh, basically, if this H is a unique function of a closed convex set, you can easily see uh, the exact minimizer of this function will be just the projection of Y to the convex uh, closed convex set. And in this case, we really have a nice uh, interpretation of the inexact solution. Okay, here, <clears throat> I just want to list uh, uh, the comparisons with some other uh, inexact solutions uh, defined in the literature, okay? So when H is a unique function of a, of a closed convex set C, uh, and B is this matrix, then, uh, this ABC are the standard uh, uh, criteria for defining inexact solutions of the sum problem. Okay, here probably let's look at the first one. The A just says zero belongs the uh, epsilon sub differential at this Z. This function, this condition is really equivalent to you want to find a Z such that the function value is uh, close uh, to the uh, optimal function value. So this condition is defined, uh, I would say, from the optimal, from the function value point of view. 
If you look at this condition, this condition says the difference from zero to the sub-differential set is less than epsilon. If epsilon is zero, then zero belongs to this sub-differential set, then you get the exact solution. But if you cut this tolerance, then it really means uh, any projection point of a ball centered at this Y with this radius would be accepted, okay? If there are no seller, if there are no tolerance, then the only solution will be the projection Y to the thing. Okay, these are the <clears throat> the uh, some standard definitions uh, for the inexact solution in the literature. Okay, so the last one is our new definition. Uh, if you look at it a little bit more carefully, you will you can see uh, this is really more. This definition is really more flexible and the uh, generalizations of these three uh, definitions. All these three are, are a special case, a special case of this new definition, okay? And uh, if you look at uh, the picture here, geometric picture here, it's even more clear, okay? And then for the first uh, definition, uh, so the true solution will be projection Y to the convex set C, that is this point. But if you use the exact solution, all the shaded this area can be accepted. Okay, the third definition just indicates uh, for for a ball centered at y y with this radius. If you projection of this ball to the convex set, that is this area. For all the points in this area can be accepted. Okay, B indicates this area can be accepted. But for our new definition, it includes everything. Okay. You, you can have a more flexible region to be accepted as a, a, a inexact solution of the sub-problem sub solution, okay? So it's, it does have some geometric uh, uh, interpretations, okay? It's not just from an abstract uh, point of view, okay? Now, um, <clears throat> now with, uh, um, with this new with our new definition of inexact solution, we can talk about our inexact uh, proximal gradient methods uh, for solving. Here, we give the framework for solving convex problem. Okay, and later we will see uh, a framework for solving non-convex problem. For non-convex problem, it has about a similar structure. Okay, but uh, but with proper definition, proper modifications. Okay, but first let's understand uh, this uh, algorithm. Um, so you, you will see this, uh, this, algorithm, this algorithm has uh, uh, two loops. Okay, it has a two loop structure, uh, a inner uh, outer loop K from one to N, a inner loop for T from one to MK. MK is the number of inner, uh, number of iterations in the uh, inner loop, okay? And we only here, we, you can see, we only calculated the full gradient in the outer, in the outer loop, in the outer iterations, okay? Here we calculate the full gradient at w, w tilde. So here, this W tilde is, uh, you can think this is the average of the, iter of the iterations generated by the previous inner iterations. This is the average of the, uh, the iterations generated by the inner previous inner iterations. Okay, you only take the full gradient as this W tilde. And inside of the inner loop, instead of calculating the full gradient, you, you calculate a stochastic gradient. For calculating a stock gradient, you use the standard technique uh, by uh, using the, the so called uh, mini batch techniques. So you just uh, run uniformly, uh, randomly uh, sample the SK component gradient and only calculate the gradient of these, these the, for these uh, uh, selected component functions, okay? And then take average. This, this is the stochastic gradient, okay, for this. And then you replace, here you have V tilde, then you replace the part of uh, this full gradient uh, associated with uh, this uh, uh, pickup index at k at uh, iteration k minus one tilde, you replace this, you minus this, then plus the newly calculated stochastic gradient. Then you use this gradient as a stochastic gradient in your sub problem. Okay? You can easily show there. This is not difficult. You can easily show uh, this. Uh, <clears throat> 
uh, this is a really uh, unbiased, uh, unbiased uh, uh, estimation of the true gradient at this point. Then you solve the sub problem in exactly. Here, I want to, want to mention here. So there's the issue for how to choose the starting point of the inner iteration. Here, the W0 is the starting point of the inner iterations. By considering the function is strongly convex or convex, you have different strategies for choosing this. Uh, in order to show convergence, you have different strategies for choosing this uh, starting point. Okay. Uh, okay, for that algorithm, we, 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 we have these comments. The first, uh, uh, this exact solution, WTK, this WTK, uh, by our definition, uh, satisfy these conditions. And uh, this uh, is uh, uh, this uh, gradient F K here. This is really an unbiased estimate of the full gradient. And uh, as I said, for different uh, for different case of the strongly convex case and a convex case, we will have a uh, different starting point W zero K here. Okay. Now let's talk about some basic convergence properties for this uh, algorithm. First, we we'll assume the function, the component function fi is Lipschitz continuous. Okay, it's Lipschitz continuous differentiable. That means uh, its gradient is Lipschitz continuous. We use this notation, and uh, based on this, uh, we can show this lemma. You can see the the, the left hand basic the left hand the left side of this lemma basically this is the variance of the stochastic gradient. This side, the variance of the classical gradient can be bounded by the right hand side. So you will see if the iterates wt minus one k, uh, the function value at these iterates converge to the full function to the true p star is the optimal function value, and uh, the the function value at w tilde converge to the full fun the uh, the true optimal function value. If this holds, then this variance will be. Uh, Asymptotically reduced. Okay, so this type of result was first uh, established by Xiao in 2014, and uh, what are our contributions? We, we just uh, extended this result to the uh, composite optimization case. That means it includes the non-smooth term H. Okay, so so this is based on the previous result given by Xiao in 2014. And also an important lemma is this lemma. This lemma just says uh, because because we want we we are using inexact uh, solutions of the sub problem. Finally, to show convergence, we needed to uh, calculate the bound for the accumulated error after each iteration. So this lemma just says okay, the WTK is the inexact solution of our sub problem. WT bar K is uh, the true solution, the exact solution, and using the full gradient, the exact gradient. We want to bond its difference, okay? What is the difference here? The difference, apparently the difference uh, comes from two results, two sources. One is uh, you do not use a true gradient, you use the classic gradient. So that, that's one error. The other error is uh, you solve the sub problems uh, inexactly, that's another error. So, so the, 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 the inexact sub problem, the solution compared with the true exact, the true uh, exact solution of the true proxy mapping sub problem can be bounded by this one. Okay. And uh, based, on, based on these two lemmas, we can show uh, can, the uh, results are kind of like this. You can show if each, if either k is sufficiently small, less than one over L. Then the expectation of the function value gap can be bounded by the right hand side. Here, if you look at here more carefully, the, these two terms are related to the inexact uh, solutions of the sub problem. This term is, is, related, is related to the stochastic gradient, not the true gradient. So we really we want to show the expectation of this go to zero. We really needed to bound uh, these three terms to make sure these three terms go to zero, kind of go to zero. Okay. So and then now based on the three previous lemma theorems, uh, we can divide the different cases uh, to show convergence. First, 
Uh, let's look at the strongly, uh, for the strongly convex case. So for the strongly convex case, we assume F is a mu or strongly convex, then you can show this P is the object function is strongly convex with the modulus mu, okay, like this way. Uh, w2, W star is the uh, minimum. Since it's strongly convex, there is a unique minimum. W star is unique, okay? Then for this case, uh, the W0, which is the starting point of the inner iteration. So this, uh, uh, we choose the starting point of this inner, of the inner iteration to be the average point of the uh, iterations generated by previous inner iterations, okay? So then this, this is uh, critical for showing convergence. Um, now with this set here, okay, then we can show if e, if eta k, eta k is a kind of step size, is a step, if it's eta k is a, a small like this, and then the, the estimation uh, of the uh, function value gap can be bounded by the previous fun estimation of the, the function value gap times a factor here, this is a factor, and plus some, some error terms, ak. ak is uh, defined by, you can calculate it, defined by this way. So, so to ensure this thing goes to zero, you, you really, you want this factor is less than one, and uh, you want to control this error term, okay? So uh, with, <clears throat> based on the previous theorem, then if f is a mu strongly convex, then if you particularly choose the, the, the algorithm parameters uh, like this way, you can show the function value estimation of the function value gap is really reduces uh, by uh, the upper bound is this, okay? More, more, more importantly, you show this gamma is less than one. So here is the error term associated with uh, the inexact uh, sub proper solutions. So now you can, you can see if we do not have this term, then it has a kind of linear convergence. It will have a linear convergence uh, in terms of ex expectation of function value gap, okay? Um, but to make it sure it converge, uh, so we want to have different choices of this eta, the, the tolerances for sub problem. So uh, <clears throat> based on previous theorem, uh, we can see if we choose that we allow, we choose uh, the subproblem tolerance epsilon tk to decrease the kind of linearly, then to achieve <clears throat> this uh, uh, accuracy, so the estimation of the function value gap is less than epsilon, the total number of component gradients is bounded by this way, is bound is by, by this bound. So, so now here I want to mention that. So this bound, so this bound, so even you solve the sub problem exactly, you still have this bound. You cannot improve this 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 bound. So that means that if epsilon t, if this tolerance decreases linearly, so uh, even we do not solve the sub problem exactly, we do not lose the complexity bound uh, from at least from theoretical point of view. Okay, and uh, more importantly, our analysis indicates you can really relax. You do not need this epsilon. To, this uh, tolerance to reduce uh, linearly, you can you can you can relax this tolerance uh, more and more without losing convergence. But if you if you relax this tolerance, that means that you, you, your 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 problem is more easily to be solved. You spend less effort to solve sub problem, but uh, <clears throat> uh, but you need a more number of component gradient evaluations. So if you relax the sub problem tolerances. Uh, you need more component gradient evaluation. So this is reasonable, okay? If, if I relax uh, the, the tolerance more, you, you need more and more function evaluations. But still, you keep the, you do not lose global convergence. That is the most uh, important point. Okay? So you can see from this analysis, uh, there's really, it's really a balance between how difficult you solve the sub problem you want and, uh, and how many function 
great, how many component gradient evaluations you want to use. So in practice, there you should choose some balances okay, to make the algorithm work well. Uh, this is the result for strongly convex case. If we if we only <clears throat> the function object function is only convex but not strongly convex, then in this case, uh, so we choose the starting point of the inner iterations uh, to be the last point of the previous inner iterations. So instead of taking the average of the previous inner iterations, you take it to be the last point. And, uh, and we require the number of uh, inner iterations. This is the number, this is MK to be, um, to be monotonically increasing. You, 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 should, you cannot keep it as constant. You should uh, uh, increase that increase the number of inner iterations. Um, okay, and with this, uh, similarly, we can uh, show a theorem like this. So previously for the strongly convex case, you can just bound the, 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 the expectation of the function value gap. But if you do not have strongly convex, you cannot bound just bound this term instead you needed to consider three terms together. These three terms as a kind of energy uh, 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 energy function. And then you bound these three terms together. Okay, then uh, to the, the this is up, up this, this right-hand side is a bound. This BK is the error. This RK is a, a term similar to the previous, to this to left-hand side, but with K, in, you can increase k by one, or with with k reduce by one, and uh, to make this converge, uh, you want this factor to be less than one, basically. And uh, so, based on the previous theorem, um, you can properly choose uh, the parameter the parameters for your algorithm like this way. Then uh, you can show now you can show the the function value gap. This is this thing is less than the right hand side okay so so to make this to to make this left hand side uh, to make this uh, uh, goes to zero so we we, we just we, we needed to choose the parameters to make the right hand side go to zero and uh, how fast it go, goes to zero depend on how fast the right hand side goes to zero okay um, so now uh, Okay, here I just write uh, uh, by the previous theorem. So a sufficient condition to make sure this goes to zero is to make sure the right hand side. Uh, you can see these are the two important terms in the right hand side goes to zero, and uh, uh, then so uh, motivated from this, you can now you can set up your parameters uh, s uh, by the s eta k and uh, epsilon by this way, then. Then we will have a, a, a similar uh, we will have a, a similar type of bounds, okay, as compared with the uh, the strongly convex case. Here, uh, epsilon k is a remember epsilon epsilon t k is a tolerance for solving the sub problem. If the to tolerance decreases linearly. Then to reach this accuracy, the number of uh, uh, component gradient evaluations is bounded by this, it has this bound, okay? Here, I, I, I want to mention that. Uh, so this bound is a little bit different from the bound if you solve the sub problem, sub problem exactly. If you solve the sub problem exactly, you can really make this tall be one, okay? Here, since we solve it exactly, we, we here we do lose a little bit. We do lose a little bit from the uh, complexity point of view. But the thing is, but the good case is, uh, normally when a problem is more difficult, you have a large uh, Lipschitz constant L. When the L is large, from our formula for this tau, this tau is really more close to one. Okay. So that means for more difficult problem, uh, you did not lose much from complexity point of view. Okay. Uh, and again, you can relax the tolerances uh, from linear uh, from um, from linear reduction to relax it to, to be 
to convert to, to zero more slowly. And uh, with this relaxation of the tolerances, uh, again, as expected, the number of component gradual, gra the number of component gradient evaluations should increase. Okay. And uh, uh, as you relax the tolerances more, like uh, we have different uh, uh, relaxations, then, then the more number of component uh, uh, gradient evaluations are needed. We give the exact uh, complexity here. Uh, again, you see there's a, again, there's a balance. Okay. How do you want, how accurately do you want to solve the problem? And uh, how much number of uh, uh, gradient evaluations you want, you can, you can accept for solving the, the whole problem, okay. Um, so these are the convex case. So now let's uh, uh, switch to the non-convex case. So this uh, is a this is a framework. You may say this is an algorithm to solve the case when the objective function f uh, is non-convex. Uh, you can see it has almost a similar structure as the convex case, but uh, there's uh, some differences. One major difference is uh, uh, the, the choice of this WK tutor. So this point, if you look at the convex case, this is uh, uh, this WK tutor is the average of the iterations generated by the previous inner iterations. Okay, here since our objective function is uh, not convex, there's no point. Actually, it's not useful at all to take uh, any type of uh, average. So you just, uh, in this case, you just choose this WK tutor to be the last point instead of the average point, to be the last point uh, of the previous uh, iterations, okay? And uh, then you calculate uh, the full gradient in the outer iteration at WK tutor. Uh, and uh, another major difference is, uh, so for the non-convex case, so you, 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 kind of randomly stop this algorithm according to some distribution, probability distribution P. This P, later, this P it really depends on, on the upper and the lower bound of this matrix B, okay? Here, we, we just want to, we want to make this algorithm to be more general to include a, a matrix B T K here. So this matrix in practice, you can use this matrix to approximate uh, uh, the second order information, say the curvature, certain some curvature information of the Hessian. Okay, so um, now uh, with this setting, uh, uh, we can show the convergence uh, of this uh, 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 inexact uh, uh, proximal gradient method for solving non convex problems as, uh, uh, by the following way. Okay. Uh, now let, let's define WTK bar. Here w, WTK bar is the uh, exact solution using true gradient. Okay, that's just the notation, but you never compute this. Okay. Then to show, then to show uh, the convergence for the non-convex case, you really needed to construct a, a new, you really need to construct a, a new energy function which is uh, the expectation of this, okay? You, you, and uh, this CTK is a scalar, uh, it's a recursively defined uh, scalar actually. Uh, and then with this uh, uh, constructed energy uh, value, then you can show the energy value reduces, okay? You may not see it reduces, but uh, it is less than the previous energy value plus this, these terms. If you want it to reduce, you need to make uh, these, these terms to be negative, okay? And, uh, and then uh, based on this lemma, uh, we can show, we can have the, the, this convergence, uh, global convergence theorem. So here we define the proximal gradient G at WTK to be this way. So here since the problem is non-convex, you cannot bound the, the function the function value gap. So the only thing is you, 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 you can show the expectation of the proximal gradient at your return point goes to zero, okay? Here we showed the expectation of this proximal gradient at the return point is bounded by this way. 
here t t is m times n m is inner iterations n is outer iterations so as uh, you take more iterations this thing so goes to zero um here the, the here the proximal gradient uh, is just a generalization of the standard gradient if this proximal gradient is zero then you get a stationary point okay uh, more more importantly so actually you can from this analysis okay you can you can actually choose the inner if you choose the inner iterations number m to be n to the power of one third, and uh, the, the, the sampling size to be n to the power of two thirds. If you choose it like this way, you can show, so to achieve uh, this accuracy, the number of component gradient evaluations and the sub problem solutions uh, have this bound, have this bound. Uh, here, this is the number of iterations here, uh, first, I want to mention that again, even you solve the sub problem exactly, uh, you will get the same bound. Okay, you do not lose uh, lose the complexity. Okay, um, by solving the sub problem exactly. Secondly, um, even you use a deterministic method to solve. If if you use deterministic method to solve this problem, so the number of iterations will be still. Uh, the bound of number number of iterations will be still like this, but uh, but uh, since one full gradient, if you take a one full gradient, it it means take a n component gradient. So if you use the deterministic method, uh, grad proximal gradient method to solve it, the total number of component gradient evaluations should be n to n divided by epsilon. Here is n to the two thirds. So so that just means. Uh, Stochastic gradient method can really save the number of comp component gradient by a factor of n to the power of one third. Okay, so it saves uh, these computations. And uh, uh, and finally, we also and we also extend uh, the problem to from Lipsch continuous to the case of the component gradient is only holder continuous. If it is only holder continuous, then this new here, the, this new is, is between zero and one. If new is one, that means Lipsch is continuous. New between zero and one, that is holder continuous. If it is holder continuous, you choose uh, M by this way, S sampling size by this way, and uh, the, prob the, the probability di distribu distribution uh, by this, okay? So then, uh, you can get uh, this uh, the number of this complexity bound for the component gradient, uh, and uh, uh, and the number of sub problems you need to solve. Okay, so you can see this is really extension of the previous results. So when v if we uh, new here, if new equal to one, we kind of recover the Lipschitz continuous case. If new equal to one, this number exactly three over two over three. This number is just one over epsilon if you, if new equal to one. So this is the kind of extension of the Lipsch continuous to hold the continuous. And furthermore, we, we can have a result to um, the case when for the case when P is uh, uh, when P satisfies the so-called uh, uh, PPL inequality. So this inequality is used in optimization to solve to, to, to show kind of linear convergence. Uh, so if you use a, a deterministic uh, gradient method to solve the problem, which is satisfy this PPL inequality, you can show linear convergence. Here we, we showed if this property holds, even you use the you use stochastic gradient method, you use the inexact solution, you still have linear convergence. Okay? So there are uh, some more. Uh, there's uh, so these are some extensions of the theoretical results. Um, now I want to briefly talk about some numerical results. Um, so we uh, we do not uh, here. Um, so we, we do not. 
do any numerical results for the non-convex case yet, yet for the second order case, we, we never do those results. We, we just uh, uh, take some, uh, perform some numerical experiments, uh, very preliminary numerical experiments when the object function is convex, okay? Here you want to solve this problem. This is a convex problem. X is a matrix uh, with side n r and c. So these two terms, these are the in our uh, these are our regularization term. These terms promote the sparsity of uh, the solution X. Okay, and this problem can be written at uh, at this format to uh, to be consistent with our problems uh, using this setup. So we can see if p equals two, uh, if p equals two, then uh, there's no closed form solution. There's no closed form. Uh, there are no closed form solution for the sub problem. Okay, and then the data we downloaded the data from the website by this uh, from this website. We use this data did some very preliminary numerical results. Uh, here, so the purpose here, we just want to verify two facts. The first one is we want to verify. So to get uh, the same accuracy, if you use the if if you use uh, um, exact solution uh, compared with the exact solution, do you really save the computational cost for solving the sub problems? Since our sub problems does not have exact uh, closed form solution, we use the block coding descent method to solve it. And then here is the result to get a similar accuracy. We can see here the, 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 the solid, this solid black line, this is uh, the, the result of exact uh, stochastic grid method. We can see by using the inexact method, we do save the number of uh, block according to descent iteration. That means save the computation for solving the sub problem. And another thing we want to verify is that compared with this inexact, compared with inexact deterministic method, whether this uh, the inexact stochastic grid method can save the number of component grading evaluations. So that is the purpose for using the stochastic grid method. Uh, here we just uh, compare with uh, the in, the the inexact uh, proximal full grading. That is a deterministic method by uh, Schmidt, 2011. So here this is the that is a curve corresponding inexact deterministic method. Uh, these are the curves uh, of uh, inexact stochastic method. We can see from here we can see we we from at least from this uh, preliminary uh, numerical experiments. We do can save the number of uh, component of, uh, gradient evaluations by using stochastic method. Okay. Um, so here, uh, the previously we choose theta k one parameter theta k uh, by this way. Then we choose a different uh, parameters theta k. Then we 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 observe the kind of a similar uh, similar uh, phenomena here. So you can see here, uh, this uh, the number of uh, uh, component gradient evaluation. Here, this vertical, this uh, horizontal axis is the number of it effective passes. That means uh, the, the number of epochs used. It really reduces, uh, it saves the, the computational evaluations of the, the component gradients here. Um, here, so this is my last slide, okay. Uh, this is, we want to give a summary. So in this talk, we propose the inexact proximal stochastic grading method for solving both convex, non-convex uh, empirical risk composite optimization. And we give a more general new definition of inexact sub-problem sub solution. And the uh, variance reduction techniques is incorporated with inside of our algorithm. And we derived the uh, uh, de desired global convergence complexities for both strongly convex, general convex, non-convex, smooth, and weakly smooth uh, objective functions. And uh, from our very preliminary numerical results, we can uh, we can see this IPSG really uh, it saves some computation compared with both uh, exact exact proximal stochastic gradient method or exact deterministic full gradient method. Okay, so uh, 
there's finally, I just want to briefly mention there are some free future works we can do. The first one we can, uh, so you can, if you look at these algorithms, so you need, uh, before you solve those uh, problems, you need to uh, explicitly know whether it is strongly convex, uh, non convex, or, or, or just a convex. You need to know those parameters, especially the Lipschitz constant L. So we want to develop an adaptive unified method for which you do not need to exactly know the, what's that, what, what are those parameters. Then it can automatically estimate those parameters. So this actually for deterministic case, we already developed a method for deterministic case, but for stochastic case, we did not do that yet. And uh, combining, and for the convex case, actually you can uh, combine that uh, uh, combining with accelerated method, necessary of accelerated method to, to, include, to improve the, the, the method, okay? And another key issue of is, uh, so here we just say we can incorporate the matrix B to, uh, for the, to, for take, to take a consideration of the second order information. But uh, how to choose this B, okay? And uh, whether it is effective or not, we, we do not have any numerical uh, experiments yet. So we may take a quasi Newton techniques or some facial information matrix. So in deep learning to, to approximate this, to give this B matrix. So, I'm, so finally, uh, everybody actually, uh, we knows if you really want to have a practical, uh, if you really want to have a practical algorithm to solve real deep learning problems, so it's indeed so the high the high performance computer using a scalable and distributed distributed infra uh, structure are needed. Okay, so you really need a high pro, high performance computing uh, uh, skills to, to to implement these methods. Uh, uh, I think. Uh, Probably the the, the stellar group is working on, on, on this. Okay, so okay, that's all for my talk. I, I I'm kind of rushed at the end. Okay, thanks, the speaker, for his talk. And if you have any question, please use the raise your hand button and Zoom. Vivek, please go ahead. Um, sure, thank you, Hung Chao. Thank you so much for a great talk. Okay, um, you know one of the challenges with. Uh, um, you know, these sort of very introduction things, is, as you pointed out, you really need a lot of um, inner, like right now, stochastic gradient evaluations, right? So yeah. your mm -hmm. NK is bigger than your condition number effectively, effectively, right? L over mu for the, for the convex, the strongly convex case. Um, so one, did you see that happening in your example or was that already, like you need, a, you really need a good problem for this type of thing to work, it seems. Oh, in, so, right. In our numerical experiments, we just take the parameters suggested by our theorem. So so that, that is, so of course we tried some uh, some cases for how to choose a Lipschitz constant. Um, but so you never know so what is the proper Lipschitz constant. Isn't the challenge usually you need like really strong regularization typically? Um, am I before I, I, I get uh, like, I said, like, like, like I said, if you do not, if your if your uh, objective function is not strongly convex, so then if you then you need to to make sure the inner iterations should be linearly increasing. So uh, the the condition is like this. So you need this condition. So this condition kind of uh, you want to. You want to do more and more inner iterations to save to to, to kind of reduce the variance of the stochastic gradient. So then, how would uh, I? I only had one last question. And um, mm. for your SGD, did you assume that the covariance was bounded, or what was the assumption? No, no, no. Right now, we we do not because we use variance reduction. It, it's we we do not assume that. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay, just one more question. So uh, whenever uh, on slide 27, you, okay, you, you said mm -hmm. that like you have given the uh, distribution P and you also gave an explanation about how to choose P. But I'm, yeah. I, I'm, I was confused there. So the probability distribution is given beforehand or it depends on the metric P. Oh, it is, a, for our case, it is given before. So it yeah. depends on, it depends on the lower and upper bound on the uh, 
the matrix, this, this matrix B. Here you can see, uh, uh, okay. So this is a pro this is a probability distribution for stopping mm -hmm. the algorithm. It depends on this uh, this kappa T K is a lower bound for so, so uh, the lower bound and the upper it's, bound is a lower and upper bound for this B matrix. Are also given as well, right? Yes, you should give. So that is uh yeah, this is given before before mm -hmm. the algorithm. Okay. Yes. Like uh, like if you use the BFGS or limited memory mm -hmm. BFGS. You can make sure you can make sure it has this lower and upper bound. Okay, to make sure all your metrics belong to this. I see. Uh, another question is about the tolerance. Uh, um, you you said like there's the tolerance error bound. Yes. And this is also given beforehand. This is a constant or rather a parameter yes. depending yes. on the right. Interval, right. 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 So so well, this is the um, the there's the gap. So the, if the problem size is pretty huge, then does it make sense to increase the error bound? Uh, these error, okay. So uh, these these type of error bounds, it's so you can see it depends on the k and the t. Uh -huh. So it is given before running the algorithm. Um, uh, if so, like I said, it there's a balance between how fast you reduce this error bound and the mm -hmm. number of uh, component gradient uh, evaluations you can accept. I see. So, so if you 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 solve the sub problem more ex exactly, you need mm -hmm. more component gradient evaluations. If you solve mm -hmm. it exactly, you may reduce the number of component gradient evaluations. But okay, the so case is, uh, if this error tolerance reduces sufficiently fast, mm -hmm. you do not lose anything. Okay. I see. So uh, you, you you have no idea that whether uh, the sub problem could be terminated exactly beforehand, right? Uh, no. You have no, to so run the... the stochastic. Uh, so at least for the non-convex case, you you just don't know. You you uh, unless one you can just calculate the grade the yeah you you just don't know. At okay. the return point, it just gives you the expectations. Of okay. Something. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So you will wait to. Wait until the end to get the value. Right? Yeah, or you randomly test if you get a good point and stop something okay. like this. Okay. Okay. Good. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank again for your interesting talk. And next uh, in two weeks at the same time, we have Dr. Andrew Lumstein, and he will give a talk with the title "Second Order Optimization for Scalable Training of DNNS." And thank you so much, and hope to see you in two weeks. Okay, thanks. Thanks for listening to the talk.